All righty. Well, this is um, our July meetup for the Champagne Blockchain Meetup Group. And we have with us here today, Matthew Plumman. Uh, Matt is a head of money market credit research for Deutsche Bank out of their New York office. And he's also building a stable coin um, in the Cardano ecosystem on the, as a side project. And Matt, do you want to have anything else you want to introduce about yourself before we go into um, an analysis of the um, responsible, uh, the uh, Responsible Financial Innovation Act that is being introduced by Senators uh, Loomis and Gilbrand. Um, no, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with the, the meetup group. And I know that this is an important one considering uh, that the integration with the University of Illinois and the Champagne community, uh, the intersection of blockchain in that community is, is, is very underappreciated by those outside of it. But this is certainly for those of us that know, um, we're definitely able to, uh, to appreciate it, just, just how important this part of the ecosystem is. So thank you for having me, Adam. Absolutely. Uh, can you all see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm going to go briefly into the bill. So uh, was it in May that this bill was announced or was it, I think it was, it was late May, if I'm not mistaken, that the, uh, the Blumis Gillibrand bill was announced and you know, it came with a great bit of fanfare because it has bipartisan support from notable senators in both parties. Uh, it also has some legs in the House. Unfortunately, neither Loomis nor Gillibrand are on the appropriate committees to get this kind of legislation passed. And so while it was met with great fanfare, it ended up kind of fizzling out, uh, particularly as people dug into the specifics of the bill and also as kind of the crypto assets uh, lost value and there's sort of this positive correlation between the will to regulate crypto assets and the price of crypto assets. So given that we're in an election year, that the calendar is short and that there's not a lot of time left to pass something quickly, uh, this has become a discussion as, as sort of turned into using Loomis Gillibrand as a starting point for Web3 regulation. And so we'll start by just kind of walking through the entire regulatory landscape and, and, the, and the possibility. So this thing does about six different things. So the, the Loomis Gillibrand bill starts off by providing a good definition for digital assets. It also talks about stable coins in a very uh, interesting way. It provides uh, legal certainty and classifications for DAOs and DAO structures. It fixes a few of the things that have been the most annoying tax items for people who are involved in blockchain. It directs various government agencies to think about allowing retirement accounts to hold crypto assets. And then it also provides, which is probably the, the most important piece of the last one, provides some certainty and some regulation around projects that raise money on tokens, including uh, disclosures that are required and how those projects are gonna be treated going forward. Does that sound good? Can we we'll go down and just dive into each one? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so first of all, this bill starts off hot, providing a nice definition for digital assets. And it does a very good job, I think, of encompassing what most people think of as digital assets and what, uh, what people think of it as not digital assets. So this is a pretty good definition, a natively electronic asset that confers economic, proprietary, or access rights or powers, and is recorded using cryptographically secured distributed ledger technology. 
So I think that's a good couple of things that come together to fairly well describe what each of us would know on its face as being a crypto asset. And it also does a, a nice little thing of says, uh, it is definitely includes virtual currency ancillary assets just for the avoidance of doubt. It goes to spell out some of the other items that are classified under this act. And I think this is a good job for two reasons. First, that it doesn't provide a whole lot of tiny minute definition that would be easy to get around. You know, the broader the scope, the, the better the, uh, the better the regulation, I guess, as far as making a definition of it that can then be, uh, can be used by the entire bill. The other thing is this doesn't necessarily exclude the JPEG PFP type projects that have been launched on the various blockchains. So the second item proprietary is sort of a derivative of property. And so if you have property ownership of a NFT project or some other kind of PFP, even if it's just a goofy little thing, uh, this would this would scoop that up in with it, but it would also be a little gentler on those kinds of projects than they would be on uh, on say projects that have aspirations to be big businesses and uh, and, and go forth. So this is really everything. Um, it does a good job of defining what digital assets are. Secondly, it moves on to define stablecoins, which they call technically payment stablecoins. And it allows banks to issue them as part of their bank charter. And right now, banks might be able to issue stablecoins, but this provides great legal certainty for banks. And that's the kind of guidance that any of them really, really want. So a bank issued stablecoin must be fully collateralized 100% with high quality assets. And high quality assets is a regulatory term that means treasury bonds, government agency bonds. There's a whole list of things that qualify as high quality assets, but they're basically those things. The, comp the, uh, the bank may do the coin in an SPV structure that would make it uh, bankruptcy remote. And that would mean that if the bank goes under, then the people that are holders of the stable coin would have assets, to, would have access first to the assets in the SPV and then later to the bank's assets. Uh, if the bank does not do an SPV that's bankruptcy remote, the stable coin holders would, get be, would be paid before FDIC insured deposits. So I guess if, if you wanna run through the waterfall mechanism of a bank resolution, the top of the stack is the deposit holders. Actually, the top of the stack is gonna be say, repurchase agreement to obligors, secured funding um, structures, and anything that's got its own dedicated funding for it. So that would be you know, anything like if you borrow against an asset, that asset would then be eligible. To, to repay the, the loan. <laughs> the bank not doing an SPV would fully collateralize the coin. So if you say you have a million dollars or a hundred million dollars or a billion dollars of, of stable coin out there, you have that much treasury agency bonds, whatnot on your books already. And then if the bank fails, those treasuries, agency bonds, would be used to pay off the stablecoin holder, but they would also be paid before FDIC insured deposits. So that would probably at the, at the margin push the FDIC into insuring more deposits on the bank or paying out more than would be otherwise for a, uh, for a bank failure. And so I think that this element contributed to having a political problem for the bill getting passed. Um, even though it allows banks to issue the stable coins, final bullet, it does allow non-banks 
to also issue stable coins that are not subject to full collateralization with treasuries or SPVs. So that's an interesting way of allowing the incumbents to continue to operate that are not bank owned while still having um, good certainty around bank issued stable coins. The next item is DAO classifications. And I just put the text of the bill in here, but what this does is this, this allows DAOs to have a bit of a uh, legal classification. Uh, this is where Senator Loomis really copied a lot of the stuff from Wyoming and they were allowing the uh, the DAO structures that are there to be sort of mapped to the federal government. So that's an interesting little little tick for this one. It's not exactly mapping, but it certainly is in spirit a uh, similar structure to the DAO terms that are that are in the Wyoming DAO structure, DAO LLC structure. It also doesn't allow certain business activities to be done by a DAO. So if you're gonna be doing treasury management, mining or staking, digital assets, those are all um, going to be eligible. So this is kind of a different thing. Following shall not be considered a business activity for purposes of determining whether such organization is described in 501c7. This is sort of uh, 501c7 carves out uh, an exemption for certain activities. But this will allow DAOs to do these things. So I know it seems like a little bit of a double negative, but DAOs would then be allowed to do mine to, to have their treasury, do mining, do staking, raise funds for charity. And uh, and those are basically what most people would think of as a DAO would be responsible for doing and allowing for, for these businesses. The Moving on a little bit, uh, tax fixes. It does have a nice little tax fix um, that airdrops, forks, et cetera, are only taxable when the assets are sold or used as payment. It also classifies mining rewards, staking rewards for stake pool operators or mining companies to be only taxable when sold or used as payments. And so this helps a lot of proof of work mining pool contracts, because right now the proof of work protocols, generally when you look at a mining pool, they will have the mining pool provider be responsible for, for they're actually selling their hash power. They're not selling the tokens that are received. And so this is uh, an interesting sort of way around that. We may see a lot of change to the proof of work mining pool contracts, because when you sell your hash rate, your hash power, it's different than, than selling the tokens. Uh, the bill, it doesn't have any thing over whether liquidity provider staking rewards or other kind of, kind of token vault staking activity would be included in this. And so I believe it would probably not be included uh, in the exemption for taxability. Again, this is another, Another sort of piece why the Loomis bill is not exactly ready to get passed yet, because there are certain items that just, just doesn't cover. The final item that it had in it was that if you make a donation of crypto assets over $5,000, you don't have to go through an independent appraisal. Uh, so generally, when you make, when you make donate donations, you can declare the value of those donations if there's something that, that are easily valued by kind of a third party in a public way. Um, art and automobiles and things that are of uncertain value, when you declare a donation of over $5,000, you need to put uh, like a separate appraisal on it. That's very costly, but you can do that now. Okay, let's, grip, let's crypto donations be a little more tax, tax exempt. Can I ask real quick, Matt? Yeah. So that's for like any is any crypto like even like uh, a major coin like Bitcoin or Ethereum or um, ADA uh, would have that requirement where you have to get the stamp. Um, you can't just trust the exchange price. 
Right. You need to go through the process of, of appraising the coin mm -hmm. currently. But if, if this were passed, so if this were passed, you'd be able to just justify using the spot price on a on like the um, market index or something. But I'm sure you'd still have to do appraisal for if somebody were donating like an NFT that was worth over five thousand dollars, because that would be like art or something, right? Uh, you might be able. I mean, this is good. This again uh, goes back to the definition. So the definition. Uh, the very first thing is any blockchain thing is a di digital asset. So I say crypto assets here, it's, it's you know digital assets that are valued over $5,000. So you could declare that your terrible NFT is over $5,000 and get, you know, not have to put an appraisal on it. So yeah, it's a little, again, this is another kind of hole in the in the legislation where if you're going to define everything as a blockchain asset or a digital asset, then there are parts that, that probably shouldn't be defined for this purpose in that way. Ah, I see what you're saying. Um, we also had a question from Neil in the chat that asked if there's a minimum DAO size that is defined in the law. No. No, this is the exact text from the law. So. A DAO utilizes smart contracts, does distributed governance, and is properly organized under some state as a decentralized autonomous organization or cooperative or foundation or similar entity. So this allows for states to make it, and then the federal government would, would, would recognize the formation um, at the state level. So. I guess a question would I put it back to to Neil? Is there a minimum DAO size that you need to have in order to set up your Wyoming DAO LLC or your Swiss your Swiss DAO or, or or whatever you've got? I don't actually know. Do you, Adam? Does Neil? Ah, so you're saying it'd be interesting to see somebody set up a DAO of one. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. I mean, I think that this is just recognizing the validity of the organization from a federal standpoint. And so it wouldn't be, I mean, you'd probably get the benefits of some sort of DAO, but this is really just kind of the federal government recognizing what the states are doing. And I was going to say, it, in if you wanted to have a Wyoming DAO LLC that was just one person in the DAO, um, you could do that. But that's pretty much also because you could also have a Wyoming LLC or any LLC that has a single member, um, and it just becomes a separate legal and you know a separate separate legal identity. Um, why why you would bother to do the DAO LLC instead of the regular LLC, um, I don't know, other than you just want to have some fun with it. Uh, I think that they would still have the same kind of rules of um, they could say you're they could say you're piercing the veil if you do anything that's too um, out of line of trying to operate as a separate legal entity apart from yourself that could be benefiting yourself or whatever. Uh, oh, there we go. Retirement accounts. This is kind of a boring thing, but important. The bill directs government agencies to evaluate whether and how to add crypto assets into retirement accounts. And so it, it's something that each of the agencies, especially in light of the, uh, the, this, the, the important EPA decision on West Virginia versus EPA, uh, you know, I know that this isn't necessarily a, a crypto decision, but one of the things that West Virginia versus EPA did set as precedent is that it raised the bar on what government agencies can do when it comes to expanding their jurisdiction or expanding their scope and incre increasing regulation of various items. And so you're you're going to need to see in the future 
bills from Congress that direct government agencies to do new things. And so right now, the Treasury, the, uh, the IRS, the National Railroad Retirement Board, and a few of the other more narrowly defined retirement systems that are out there that are kind of defined contribution systems can't necessarily on their own make a determination that crypto assets are eligible assets for inclusion in that kind of an account. What they can do is they can ask Congress to give them the authority to make that determination or Congress can, can direct them to, to study the issue and make a determination about whether or not it would be uh, something that they would want to add. And so this really gives that the agencies a little bit of a runway, but also a bit of a stick to that if they don't approve crypto assets, then they would need to be uh, you know, considered and reasonable uh, objections. So, and those, those decisions could be challenged in court. So it would be uh, quite an administrative task to either accept or reject um, crypto assets and retirement accounts, but this would definitely designate or direct the government agencies to, to see if that's something that they could do. And finally, the most important piece is that it provides a framework around projects that start raising assets on blockchain. So the if you go and you you you, you know launch your board apes yacht club spinoff that is going to be a project that's PFP, it's it's ownership, it's uh, it's it's you know membership in a community. If you're doing something on, on blockchain that's going to be basically an equity fundraising, what this does is it designates that token as a commodity, which is, it's that's a silly thing that the media really glommed onto. And I think that a lot of the staffers were excited to make that the highlight. But being a commodity doesn't exempt you from anything in this bill. All that being a commodity does is it removes the history of the case law regarding equity from these kinds of projects. So one of the items that has come up from the case law over the years, because equities have been around since, you know, since the 1920s, probably before that, certain, you know, they've been around for, for a long time, but as far as the regulated space, since uh, I think it was the, the 30, 32 Act, um, the 40 Act was for mutual funds, but there was since the 20s and 30s, there's been sort of a regulatory track record of case law that follows what uh, what means what equity being equity means. If you're a corporate director of a board, then the equity holders are your primary responsibility. You have a fiduciary duty to the shareholders to maximize their value. That's part of the law of being on a board and being being an equity holder is you can expect the management, you can expect the board to try to maximize your value. And when you think about all of the different little settlements and lawsuits and whatnot that have come down the pipe over the years, there's a hundred years of, of history there that wraps up companies that are doing equity fundraising in the public markets. And you know, banks and law firms are, are well equipped to deal with that. But when you designate these items as commodities, there's not a whole lot of that fiduciary duty back and forth going on to be able to kind of burden the, the rulemaking process. So what Loomis Gillibrand does is it puts into place this designation as a commodity, and then from kind of a tabula rasa point of view, goes about stating what disclosures have to be made for projects that want to do fundraising. Um, specifically speaking, it provides a list of required items before offering a token sale. This could be a good baseline for disclosure to help instill like confidence in teams and their activities, but I really fear that this will only push projects further away from US participation. So. It sets up, scoops up all larger crypto projects that are uh, $5 million 
uh, or more into the regulatory landscape and requires extensive disclosures about the business and the token structure. So new projects uh, that have already launched are gonna need to do this and projects that are launched before January 1st of 2023 will have until quote unquote, the beginning of the next business year to comply. So basically if a project follows the calendar year for fiscal purposes, they have until January 1st of 2024 to comply. Now, I don't think this bill will pass before January 1st, 2023. So that could be pushed off for a year. Uh, basically they're gonna give everybody a one year notice period that if you launch your project before January 1st, then you have a year to comply with the, uh, you know, with the, with the bill requirements. So the disclosures that are required, I'll run through the list here very quickly, you know, basic corporate information, the existence, so A, the existence of the issuer in developing assets similar to the ancillary asset. Yeah, if the issuer has previously provided any assets to the purchasers of securities, information on subsequent history of those previously providing ancillary assets, the activities that the issuer has taken in the relevant disclosure period, uh, the anticipated cost of the activities, the extent to which the asset involves the use of particular technology, the backgrounds of the board of directors or senior management, key employees of the issuer, a description of the assets and liabilities of the issuer, the description of any legal proceedings to which the issuer is engaged, uh, information relating to transactions involving the asset, uh, recent sales or similar disposition of the assets, so kind of any insider team trading, um, purchase or dispositions of any assets or similar assets, the ongoing concern for, and basically a, a, an ongoing concern statement. So it's a ton, ton of stuff. Um, Neil, the volatile assets, so 5 million win. It is $5 million worth of tokens traded daily, but that could mean if you raised 5 million in your token sale, you'd be, you'd be um, scooped up. So you don't fall out of, you don't, you don't fall out of scope because your value, your assets are valued less. If you've got, if you've raised 5 million, if you've gotten 5 million ever, then you have to do all these things. But the one thing that's the most important uh, disclosure is the risk factors disclosure. Um, it's risk factors relating to the impact of the issuer on or unique knowledge relating to the value of the ancillary asset. So ancillary asset would be the token. If you launch a project, so, so the risk factors disclosure is the one that's the most litigated piece of disclosure in uh, corporate public law. Um, every shareholder lawsuit that you can imagine has some element of, oh, by the way, this wasn't included in the risk factors disclosure, and so we should get damages, therefore. So a lot of the companies that are, you know, when you see the stock price go down, um, shareholder lawsuits will ensue. And, uh, you know, one of the important ones was like Wells Fargo, but they didn't include the structure of compensation for the people that were setting up bogus accounts. And there was a risk factors disclosure around that because, or risk factors uh, lawsuit around that disclosure because there, there was no, um, there's no disclosure of that. So you need to disclose everything, every possible risk factor, everything you could possibly have that could affect the value of the token. Um, and this makes it no easier to set up a company using a token structure than using a public equity structure. There's only the matter of size. So you don't have to be as big to be scooped up in this as you would to be scooped up in some kind of a, a public equity offering. So that's that's kind of really where the, the rub is on this whole deal, where as long as the risk factors disclosures are in there and you need to make sure that everything is, is tied, tied and tidy, then I mean, it's good to have the risk factors disclosure, but it's not good to say, well, now you're still subject to lawsuits because you didn't include absolutely everything in the risk factors disclosure. 
So you have to just include similar disclosures about the assets. So risk factors of the assets, you know, general description of what the asset is. And so how, basically what is the token? There's a whole laundry list of things that you have to put out before you can go to raise money by selling your token. Um, this provides a huge hurdle for US companies to go out and, and raise money like this. It also provides a good, a good amount of, of protection for token holders. But I think that there's an, this is another uh, part of the legislation where the burden was just very was just too high to get everybody to sign on to passing this bill. Um, it will provide all kinds of extra extra trouble. But you you do want to at the same time be mindful that token holders should have rights and they should have the ability to expect certain things of the projects that they're buying tokens from. And so in, in both cases, I think that you need to strike a balance, but in this, in this case, the balance was struck um, you know, far too much on the side of just disclose absolutely everything and, uh, and open up the, the boards and the project leads to, to lawsuits for, for missing something. So that's the presentation. That's Loomis Gillibrand. Um, it does have a lot of nice stuff in it. Uh, which was kind of a good starting off point for putting together a regulatory landscape that would apply to blockchain assets, DeFi protocols, um, cryptocurrencies, and project tokens. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, this is Todd. I had a question about the disclosures. Yeah. Uh, so I could understand, I mean, see if I understand this right, like the the equity disclosure law would prevent a company from creating a uh, creating stock that they could sell on a U.S. exchange if they didn't comply with the the laws of of the SEC, right? Related to creating a, a issuing stock. But how would this be in, be enforced for a token that's sort of international? I mean, someone could create the token and not live in the U.S. And then how would the U.S. enforce it? Would they block people from buying it or block it from being sold on U.S. crypto exchanges? I think so. You know, currently, the way things work is you, if you raise any money from U.S. investors, then you would be subject to oversight by the SEC and the other U.S. regulatory agencies. So that's one case where the you, know, you don't even need to be a U.S. person, but you need to be a U.S. Um, you need to have you know sufficient contacts with the U.S. I believe is what it's called. And in, in, in raising any money from U.S. people, then you would have to also be subject to the rules that are required there. I mean, I'm sure that there's some sort of a, you know, a trade-off in, in part of, le you know, part of like the legal realism of enforcing this on a foreign, uh, foreign fundraiser for minimal values, but you still need to comply even if you have, um, if you have this $5 million threshold, you need to go through the process of, of disclosing everything and, and, uh, and abiding by the regulation. So you talked about how this is um, seen by um, a lot of people as being um, difficult for U.S. companies to be able to really um, engage with, and it makes it so that there's not really much of an advantage of doing then a token sale over a traditional company. Are there other jurisdictions that do it differently that you would could point to as being something that cons like um, both builders and consumers find as um, a happier balance? I don't know that I'd be well equipped to answer the question exactly, but I would say that the Australian model, so that one of the things that is unspoken in this regulation is that the, the direction of all securities 
law, not all, but you know, the direction of the majority of securities law is at the person raising the money or the company raising the money. So if you're, if you go out there and you do uh, a sale of securities, be it, you know, equity securities, debt securities, whatever it is, and you do an unregistered securities offering and you don't take care that it's only raising money from people who are eligible to take money from, then you will be in violation of the law and the SEC will come after you, the, you know, the, the fundraiser for having taken money from people that you shouldn't take money from. In Australia, the law is a little different where individuals are able to invest up to a certain amount of money in any venture they see fit to invest in. And the individual then is accountable for taking, taking care of that. And one of the things that I would have liked to have seen in this bill is a better distillation of the rules around uh, eligible participants in unregistered securities offerings and give individuals you know, a small budget, if you will, of money that they can invest in private placements so that individuals would be able to not only invest in crypto assets or projects like this without fear of, you know, without, without an issue or fearing that they've done something that's in violation of securities laws, but also then individuals would be able to participate in IPOs. They'd be able to participate in, uh, in, kind of in, in, in larger scale uh, markets that are currently closed off to them. Uh, so, so that's one thing I would have liked to have seen in this bill. And that's the way that Australia does it when it comes to allowing individuals to, to give money to unregistered offerings, but in a smaller amount. Um, Neil has an interesting comment. He says he knows a lawyer who argues that DAOs should legally organize as cooperatives in the U.S. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think it would depend on which state they're in, but it, your, your lawyer friend might, might be right. One, one thing that I did see uh, regarding that um, was I had uh, a meeting with someone who was looking at like, a, I think maybe they were looking at the Wyoming cooperative um, laws. I think that's what they shared with me. And it had really, really um, detailed rules of how the cooperative had to um, obtain and keep the information of its members and how it had to manage the members as well. Um, which, you know, um, people in the blockchain space have various views of KYC and there's um, definitely, you know, a lot of projects take um, do KYC to make sure that they stay within regulations. Uh, but I feel, felt like this was some of the more stringent versions of not only of KYC, but also just sort of like um, membership uh, management where it would take away some of the flexibilities that DAOs might want to have in the way they manage their members if they had uh, the cooperative rules. So I don't know if all cooperative, if, like there are different ways to, I, I don't actually know much about cooperatives, like of different ways that you can organize them outside of uh, individual states and what people might find is easier or harder or better or worse, depending on what they're trying to do. Well, here we are at the top of the hour. So I wanted to just thank you for letting me come and speak to this group. And I, I do appreciate the opportunity to help educate people on this bill and any potential other legislation that should come down the road. Uh, I do know that the New York Department of Financial Services did something about stable coins recently that was basically in line with what the bank backed stable coins are, are required to go through. So. I believe New York registered stable coins have to be backed by a money market fund that's substantially invested in government securities. So that's one 
very safe, secure way of backing the stablecoin. Um, but there's all sorts of other regulations. If you, if you pay attention at the state level, if you pay attention to the federal level, people are coming through. Um, various states want to be first. They want to be innovative or they want to be the ones to kill it. Uh, New York is a very hostile environment for, uh, for the more entrepreneurial crypto activities, but they're putting together some very strict laws that some would say entrench incumbents, but others would say uh, provide a lot of certainty for people who would like to interact with those incumbents. So it could go either way. And as we, as we see more, we'll certainly try to keep the community informed. So thank you, Adam, and thank you to the Champagne Blockchain Meetup. Thank you, Matt. Um, we're really glad to have everybody here for the for our meetup. Um, we'll post information about this talk on our well, we'll post the whole talk on our YouTube channel, um, which you can access, and hopefully some notes about this on uh, the Immutable Research Institute website, um, immutableresearch.org, and um, also on our Twitter account, iri at iri underscore blockchain. Uh, so thanks a lot, and we'll sign off for today. Have a good one.